Hi, it's Rob Bryanton. Welcome back. Imagine the Tenth Dimension Project. This is the video blog for December thirteenth, two thousand seven. Uh, today, if you go to tenthdimension.com/blog, there's a poll that's finishing off. I have to say, I'm really uh, surprised but thrilled to see how many people participated in this poll. It looks like uh, uh, each poll there's more people that are participating, and uh, today's poll ending is about uh, two thousand twelve. Uh, I've been talking a little bit about uh, how. Uh, if you're imagining all the different timelines that could have happened for our universe, that there will always be uh, times when people are predicting that uh, something is going to be happening in the future. And uh, Y2K being a great example where everybody was saying something horrible was about to happen. And uh, in the timeline that we're on, it turned out Y2K was not... Uh, not a really big deal at all. Uh, 2012 isn't really an end of the world prediction per se, it's more a, a, an idea of expanding consciousness, but again, here we are, it's five years from now that uh, this is being predicted to happen. By the time we get to six years from now, we'll be able to, to know for sure whether it happened or not. Uh, what I've been talking about with the Imagining the Tenth Dimension project is that, uh, that no matter what you're thinking about, if you're thinking of a prediction that's coming from the future, it's quite possible that there are other timelines, branching timelines that exist within the, the fifth and sixth dimension where those predictions did come to pass. And uh, it's just going to be interesting to see. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of people that are getting very, very excited about uh, the idea that consciousness is accelerating. Uh, I think that has a lot to do with the things that are happening with uh, Google and all the different ways that people are c connecting together across space and time. But uh, it might also be very connected to Ray Kurzweil's ideas as well uh, about an, uh, an approaching, approaching singularity. So uh, the video blog that uh, we're continuing here today is a, the third part of a three-part uh, discussion about boredom and consciousness. So uh, I'm just going to jump right into it right now. Boredom and consciousness part three. In boredom and consciousness part two, we talked about how boredom is very much a conscious part of our minds. If you're driving a car properly, you're performing a constant series of checks completely automatically. Your conscious and subconscious minds are working as one. The brain is entirely capable of taking you from one side of the city to the other without your narrator voice interfering with what, with what you're doing. But what if that narrator voice instead had been telling you how boring the drive was? You'd be much more likely to have had an accident through being inattentive to all the possible danger signs that our subconscious minds deal with constantly as we drive. Even something as simple as, and uncomplicated as falling asleep is almost impossible to do if you can't find a way to quiet that darn narrator voice of consciousness, as anyone who's tried to fall asleep when they're upset or excited knows only too well. Do you like to garden? Some people can't stand it because it's so boring. Other people love simple, repetitive activities like these because it gives them peace. In other words, gardening can be a form of meditation. And meditation, of course, is actually not that far away from boredom, because meditation is an activity that encourages us to move through and beyond our line of time with an integrated mind, quieting that nagging narrator voice that says, this is boring, and moving into a state that Julian Jaynes tells us we used to always exist within. Here's what I say in my book about meditation. Meditation is a particularly interesting example of how people can use the power of the mind to change their health and circumstances. Researchers analyzing the EEGs of persons in a meditative state have seen that the parietal lobe, which processes incoming data to give a person the sense of their location in time and space, becomes much less active during meditation. If the parietal lobe would be what anchors us in the first through fourth dimension, time and space, then could suppressing that part of the brain be what opens the person who is meditating up to the healing paths available to them in the higher dimensions? This same Scientific American Mind article on boredom we were discussing in part two also talks about the rising popularity of mindfulness training and med education medical and office settings, which is a form of meditation that helps people to become more in tune with the wonder of their day-to-day -day lives. Elsewhere in the, the issue uh, is a review of a book by Jeff Warren called The Head Trip. Jeff describes consciousness as a wheel that can be broken into 12 states from highly alert to deeply asleep. 
I was interested to see that what started him down the path of writing this book was exactly what we're talking about here. He was working a potentially boring job as a tree planter and became fascinated with how his perception of time some seemed completely different while doing his job. While some people would look at, at a menial and repetitive job such as this and find their day agonizing, sl agonizingly slow, he found that time passed by almost without him noticing. In other words, one person's boring is another person's meditative state, or even another person's novelty. When people who have watched my 11-minute animation or read my book say that it's mind-blowing, my fervent wish is that I've helped to renew and expand their sense of wonder about this amazing universe we live in. There are a great many self-help books and breathing exercises and visualizing techniques out there that people can use to change their way of perceiving the world. Mine is another. That's why I describe this project on the back of the book as a mind-expanding exercise that could change the way you view this incredible universe in which we live. In part one of this entry, we talked about the quantum physics idea that it's actually possible for consciousness to change the past, an idea that hadn't occurred to me, not surprisingly, since I've spent so much time thinking instead about how this way of imagining reality expands out what our possibilities from this moment forward might be. But even if the idea had occurred to me first, I suspect I would have dismissed it as being too out there, even for me. However, with ex esteemed physicists like John Wheeler pointed the way, and the research of physicists like Rosenblum, Kuttner, Krauss and Dent, all of whom are mentioned in the, the previous blog entry, this idea takes on interesting resonances when we think about meditation and the integrated bicameral mind as being the mental processes where we stop being bored and start freeing ourselves from our linear 4D succession of frames that we call time. So this week's poll question uh, ending today is about 2012. Where do you stand? Could those predictions of a coming global transition be tied to Terence McKenna's novelty theory, also known as Time Wave Zero? And uh, do a, a, a Wikipedia search on that uh, novelty theory uh, if you want to find out some interesting ideas about that idea. Kurzweil uh, and his approaching singularity, Ray Kurzweil, uh, a, a futurist, an expert on artificial intelligence and computing, and uh, also a developer of uh, many famous uh, lines of, of synthesizers. Uh, you can uh, go just type in the, the singularity and you'll find lots of interesting things about that. Or the many other impending predictions being pointed to by prophecy and ancient wisdom. Uh, all of these can be tied together, I think. Uh, our minds, as patterns, as pattern recognizing machines, have ways of connecting across the information of time and space. Our bodies, built from chemical processes that obey the laws of entropy, can only move in one direction in time. But if it really is possible for consciousness to tune the universe, as John Wheeler suggested it, then we would have proof that our consciousness can freely move in any direction, and at any angle we choose. Thinking of an accelerating shift where everyone's consciousness tilts at an ever more extreme angle to our 3D space to eventually encompass all of time, allows us to imagine the potential for our world to enter a timeless mindset. The idea that this possibility appears to be approaching at an increasingly accelerated pace is also one of the ramifications, ramifications of this that is getting more and more people excited around the world. Are you interested in what happens next? I know I am. Uh, that's it for the video blog. Uh, we're going to finish off with a song that uh, was one of the songs that I created for this project. Uh, we're just going to watch the the uh, karaoke, the instrumental version of it uh, to finish off here. But uh, thinking about how meditation and meditative states can allow you to enter a different mindset and potentially uh, heal yourself or improve your attitude towards the world is one of the reasons why I included this song. It's called Turquoise and White. That's all for today from Rob Bryanton, Imagining the Tenth Dimension. Bye for now.